Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Q&A panel. Um, it's early in the morning. Are we all awake yet? Okay, good. I don't even need this. Do I even need this? It just sounds cooler. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, good morning. My name is Ryan Drummond, and uh, most of you know me as the original video game voice of Sonic the Hedgehog from 1998 to 2004. It's been a minute, um, but uh, still doing the voice today. For those of you who... Um, have seen Sonic or listened to Sonic and Tails R on YouTube. Uh, been doing that recently, and obviously appearing at conventions all across the country, um, including Sacramento today and yesterday. So we're here. Does anyone have a question that we can start off with? I knew you. I knew you would. I knew you wouldn't disappoint me. You start it off. What is your first question? I have played the drums. Isn't that funny? But the reason not is not because of my last name. Um, I actually started off, you know, when you're young and they tell you you have to start playing an instrument in elementary school. I picked the trumpet because I was just like, it's loud. It's only got three buttons. It looks like it's fun to play. And so I, uh, I tried to play the trumpet. And after about a year of playing the trumpet, I wasn't good at it at all. And I thought, I'm going to do something that's not very musical. But uh, I really liked rhythm, so I took up the drums, and I played those for about five years. And then I just went to being uh, just a singer, and I stopped playing instruments. So yeah, I got a little bit of trumpet experience and a little bit of drum experience, but mostly just singing. Yeah, like you. Yeah. <laughs> Who's got question number two? Yes, sir. I just want to say thank you so much for coming out. It really means a lot to all of us to see you here in Sacramento. Of course. But, uh, Oh, uh, my favorite line. Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I've got a few favorite lines, um, but it's kind of the ones that have lived on in infamy after. I mean, it's been so long, I don't really remember recording them at the time, <clears throat> but I mean, I've certainly played the games and, you know, the whole like, <laughs> it's going to crash. You know, um, those those are uh, humorous to me because I don't remember recording them, but they sure made it in the game. Um, favorite moment from recording? Um, I think, and it wasn't actually the recording of it, but it was right after the game came out. And um, contrary to maybe popular belief, I'm kind of an introvert myself. Like I'm not, I'm not like a, I have public speaking skills. Um, because I've been in the theater all my life, but like when it comes to like what I want to do in my free time, I always want to be by myself. Like I'm not like a same way. Yeah. Like the, uh, they say like, you know, if, if you want to be the life of the party, that's totally not me. I'd rather be in the corner of some party having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody. That's just the way I have always been. And, um, and so when I was recording Sonic, the casting director and some of the directors said, you know, this is going to be a big thing. This is going to, this is going to change, change your life. And I was kind of like, okay, cool. Um, and I had had some kind of little brushes with fame earlier in my career. Um, like two years before I did Sonic, I did a commercial for the San Diego Padres. And it was one of those commercials where uh, it played every hour on every channel for the entire summer. And uh, it was just me talking about how the Padres are on Channel 4. And I was like, you know, there's four infielders, four bases, even the word itself, baseball. It's two four-letter words. And it was all about four, 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 four. And so I just shot this commercial on the beach at San Diego. And for the rest of that summer, it was one of those things where I could not go anywhere without people pointing, talking, going four, four. You know, hey, there's the Padres guy, the Padres guy, four, four, four. And it was kind of my little taste of what real celebrities go through, like global celebrities. And um, because I, I couldn't even go to the grocery store without being, I don't want to use the word harassed because that's not the right word, but, you know, being confronted <laughs> about being the Padres guy in Channel 4 and so forth. And uh, I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. I mean, it, it was kind of interesting at first, you know, to walk outside and have complete strangers recognize you. There's, it's kind of entertaining for a minute. 
And then after that, you become, or I became, I should say, very paranoid. So every time I would go out, I would try to wear disguise or I'd pull my hat down and sunglasses and I would try not to get recognized because it was uncomfortable to me. And so when I was recording the Sonic games, they kept telling me, oh, this is going to be a big thing. You know, it's going to it's going to really put you on the map. It's going to make you recognizable. And to their faces, I was kind of like, cool, you know, but inside I was like, "Ugh," you know, and what I learned, what I figured out from being a part of a, uh, a video game that had such a global appeal like Sonic is that um, the people who are really into the games know who you are, but most of the world does not. Like if you ask 100 people in this country who's Ryan Drummond, 99 of them won't know who I am. Maybe one of them will. But um, I actually, when the uh, game was released about a week later, they had it on a display at the Target store where I lived. And uh, I was just happened to be shopping at Target and I walked by the electronics department and there was this whole gaggle of kids just kind of, you know, huddled around this monitor and they're playing the Sonic game. And, and I start hearing my voice coming out of the, the television monitor. And, uh, and so I just stood there behind him and I just watched him play for like 15 minutes. And no one ever turned around. No one ever knew it was me. And I was just kept thinking, this is so cool. Like, I can have this really great job, but none of these people know who I am. And I can just shop at Target in peace. And so that was probably one of the cooler moments where I realized, like, this was going to only change my life in a good way, not in a you'll never be able to have a moment of peace again kind of way. So, yeah, that's one of my favorite parts. Now, we can we can all be cool. Everybody in this room will be cool. But once I leave the Scottish Rite Center and go, you know, have dinner over here, no one's going to come over and ask me to sign anything. <laughs> no one's going to, you know, ask me any questions. It's just going to be normal life. And I love that. Who else has a question? Yes. I got a fun answer, hopefully. I asked Brian Craig Smith, what would you say if, if Sonic were, I mean, what would you say? What is what kind of music would Sonic listen to? Ooh, what did Roger say? I'm curious. Speed metal? Speed metal? Yeah. yeah, you know what? I hate to borrow Roger's, but I, that was kind of my thought. Hell yeah. I, I kind of thought something, something really fast, of course, and uh, what's faster than speed metal? So he'd probably be like a, like a Slayer fan. Motorhead, a little Hawkwind, you know, Stormtroopers of Death, you know, just the good light stuff. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Roger on that. And you know what's funny? Uh, I have actually not met Roger yet. Really? I've, we have never met in real life. We talk and so forth, um, but I've never met him. So maybe one of these days we'll be at the same convention. It was actually, um, it was only the last... Last year, I think, that Jason and I happened to be at Sonic Revolution in Los Angeles together. And he had his um, agent, and I had a different one. And we just happened to be at the same convention together. And we were surprised at how many people were... We always kind of thought, he and I always assumed, that people were either a fan of my era or a fan of his era. And we were really pleasantly surprised at how many people are fans of both eras. Or that grew up, you know, somewhere in the middle. Like they started off playing the games that I was in. They finished playing the games that he was in. And um, we got such a good reaction from uh, Sonic Revolution in Los Angeles that that was when um, our man, his manager said, hey, why don't you get on our team and we'll send you and Jason to all the, the conventions together. And, uh, and it's been great. I mean, not only because Jason is the greatest guy in the universe, right? So I get to hang out with him every time we go anywhere. But... Uh, kind of hoping to get Roger on the same team so that uh because Mike Pollock is on our team too as well as Lisa and Pete Capella voice of silver he's on our team as well so if we can get Roger to get on our team we'll be an unstoppable force that's what we want you. yeah you're welcome curiosities yes mm -hmm. Yeah. It was more direct. For example, I would say Jason Griffiths from New York. Right. Sonic kind of is more to the point. Remember, right. And you're from California, so this is kind of much more indirect. So for games where there's like 
aliens invading all humans enslaved like humanity. <laughs> Louis Stein, Lord Eggman's battleship, and Eggman's splitting apart the continents of the Earth. Yeah. I think his tone of voice is more fitting for those as opposed to you know, some of the heroes and some Avenger. But my question for you is, if you were to continue voicing Sonic throughout the ages, mm -hmm. how would you have done the wear model? Because with Jason Griffith, he had to change his voice to be more darker, right. more snarls. And yeah. So I'd love to hear your take on Sonic the wear model. Oh, boy. Well, I was thinking you'd have to be deeper, breathier, snarlier. So maybe something like this. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that. <laughs> yeah. Something werehoggy. All right. Who else has got something that's been burning through their mind? Yes. Yeah, um, I'm guessing you've seen, you've probably seen the Sonic movies, right? I um, have. Before. Yeah. Um, are there, I'm wondering, are there, are there things that, uh, uh, are there things that you think you feel, you feel worked about, uh, about what they did in the, with Sonic in the movies, and there, are there things that you might have done differently um, if you had been uh, the voice of Sonic? Absolutely. Um, and just as like we were just mentioning, like I think they really tailored those movies to Ben Schwartz's interpretation of the character. And I think it really worked. I really enjoyed the movies. I think they were really fun to watch. Um, and I've always been a fan of Ben's. Um, and he, by the way, has been the most gracious uh, human being like ever. Like when he got cast in that, um, he sent me a tweet that was just like, oh no, it was when I saw the movie. And I said, you know, that he had done such a great job in the movie and he sent me a reply and he was just like, I'm so honored to be a part of this franchise with you and carrying the torch and, you know, just the, the sweetest, you know, um, most respectable guy. Um, so I haven't met him in real life either, but, um, but every time we've talked, he's been nothing but just the coolest, coolest guy. So I think, uh, I, I think if they had cast me in the movie, which they they wouldn't, right, because they needed a star, right, um, which is why they didn't hire Roger for the movie, of course, because they got to get a name in there, right? As if Jim Carrey wasn't a big enough name, they needed somebody, <laughs> they needed another name to play Sonic. But um, I definitely would have would have uh, done things differently, but not better. I think it would have been. I think it would. I mean, it would have been better for me. But if I would try to do the script that they wrote for Ben, I don't think it would have worked as well, and vice versa. If he had done something that they had written for me, I, th I don't think it would have gone as well either. But I think they really tailored it to his strengths. And, um, and I think I would like to think they would have done the same for me if I had done the voice in the movie. But here's hoping, you know, they're going to make a third movie, and so me and Jason and Roger and maybe a couple other people are all kind of petitioning. It's like, you know... Remember what they did for the Mario movie when they put Charles Martinet in, you know, not as the voice of Mario, but as, you know, the family members and everybody talked about it. It was great marketing. And uh, Charles Martin and, I, and Martinet and I actually have the same agent in San Francisco. So I talked to him about it. And, he, and this was before he retired from doing the voice. But uh, but he was just like, yeah, they they called me up and wanted me to, you know, do these cameos. And of course, it's for marketing. And that's fine. You know, that's the way that business works. Um, but every, everyone keeps, uh, you know, all the agents are contacting the people in charge of the third movie saying, uh, do you know how helpful it would be for your marketing campaign if you would put Roger and Jason and Ryan <laughs> as little cameos in this movie? And so we're hoping they will take the bait and we will um, at least be something in the third movie. Here's hoping. Yeah. What else you got? Yeah. Because of your role with Sonic, have you become inclined to learn more about actual hedgehogs? And if so, any of that translate or makes the voice actor do that? So, so, so the question is, do uh, have I become more interested in actual hedgehogs? Did you learn about them? Right? Did I learn about them? Yeah, What's up, Noah? Um, actually, yeah. I, I, I've noticed that anytime, you know, probably my Twitter feed is full of Sonic stuff, cute animal stuff, um, sports bloopers, you know, all the things the algorithm thinks that I want to see. And so I get a fair amount of like real live hedgehog stuff that shows up on my feed. And uh, I always, always enjoy those. So I, I, I guess I'm embarrassed to say I don't know too much about actual hedgehogs. 
Although I do know that um, our manager, I was not at this one, but sent Jason, I think it was one of the first events he did for this, um, our management company is called Priority Appearances. And apparently one of the first things that they sent Jason and I think Pete Capella to was a, an actual hedgehog convention. And um, it was just like the two of them sitting there at a the table and all these people with like all these live hedgehogs in little cages and shoe boxes and stuff. And they were like, no one knew who they were. They <laughs> Apparently there was some mix up where they thought everybody would really dig having the voice of Sonic the Hedgehog there. And uh, he said he just sat there all day. No one ever talked to him. And there's, you know, thousands of live hedgehogs crawling around everywhere. <laughs> I was like, that sounds awesome. But I didn't go to that. But no, I don't know. I don't really know anything about them. But um, I, uh, I've uh, always considered getting one for a pet. But I'm a cat person myself. And I think my cat would probably kill it. So, yeah. When my cat goes away, maybe I'll get a hedgehog. Yeah. Noah, what do you got? He's my question factory. He's always got something. <laughs> My favorite Sonic game? Uh, it's a double answer. My favorite Sonic game, just for the pure uh, nostalgia of it, is the original Sonic Adventure. And I say that because that was my first game. So that was my first experience with the character and with the franchise. And um, so that is very, very special to me. It's tattooed on my heart, as they say. But if I'm playing the games, my favorite game that I've worked on that I actually like to play is Sonic Adventure 2. Woo. And some, a lot of people agree with that. So to play, it's the second one. For uh, for heart centered reasons, it's the first one. Yeah. 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 Great question. Yeah. For those in the back, she was asking if I'd ever done a voice uh, that actually strained or hurt my voice in some way. Um, yes. Um, I would say, I don't think it actually like harmed my voice because I've uh, been a singer all my whole life. So I kind of know about the physiology of the voice and I know about breath support and so forth. I had a, a, a voice teacher back in the day that, uh, that pointed out something to me. And, and since you're an aspiring singer, maybe you'll find this interesting too, is that my voice teacher said to me, um, how is it that babies can scream all day long and never lose their voice? Those of you with small children, you know that's true. They can scream all day and never lose their voice. And why is that? And as it turns out, it's because babies are born knowing how to breathe correctly and they relax their throat and they breathe correctly. It's just how you're born. And so we as adults can recreate that. And the more you learn how to breathe correctly, and how to relax your throat. And um, like earlier when I was doing the werehog thing, you could hear there was texture in the voice going, <laughs> you know, but that's all fake. That's not because I'm stressing my voice. It's, it's all, it's all uh, texture that I'm putting on it through, through the mechanism. And those sorts of things don't hurt your voice. So um, there was one time in 2003 where I was recording Sonic for eight hours a day and I was actually in a show at the time so I had to sing for two hours a night. So for a whole weekend I had to do Sonic for eight hours and then sing for two hours. And when I got to the end of Sunday I thought I'm gonna have no voice left. But as it turned out I was doing everything correctly, remembering to breathe, doing every, you know, not putting stress in my voice and I made it through the whole weekend just fine. So I think the more that you uh, take those voice lessons and learn how the voice works, you can do those things without hurting yourself. And that, that goes for stamina too. I did a show um, called Forever Plaid. I don't know if any of you know it, but it's a, it's a show where you sing for two hours straight. And I did this show for over a year and a half, eight, eight shows a week for a year and a half. And when I started it, my voice was really tired at the end of the first show. And the guy who had already been in the show for a long time told me, in about three months, when you get to the end of the week, you'll feel like you could do a ninth show if you had to. And sure enough, it was actually three months and two weeks where I got to Sunday and the end of the show and I felt fine. And it's like, it's a muscle that you build up like anything else. You know, you have stamina. If I were to run from, you know, 
here to the middle of downtown, I'd probably have to stop about halfway and walk because I just don't have the stamina to run like that. But if I train for it, I could run all day and not get tired. Same with the voice. As long as you keep training and learning how it works, you don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to hurt yourself. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite things to do at these conventions is to bring up obscure roles the person has played. I love that. Like Mark Strike Smith, I asked him about Chevy Green Trump Month and he gave the whole speed up. At least in 2014 or 2024, then he worked in zero down after $75 a month. Nice. <laughs> my question for you is what was it like playing Willy Wonka for the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? That is so obscure that I don't even remember doing it. Um, is that a credit that I have? I have a friend who says that you did it, so if you didn't, I'm sorry. I no, no, that's totally fine. I, uh, I, I, uh, I don't think so. Your friend may be right, but I don't remember doing Willy Wonka because I'm a huge Willy Wonka fan. I grew up with the original movie, and Gene Wilder is an idol of mine. So um, I think I would remember that one if I had done it. So tell your friend I, I think they got wrong information, which is uh, amazing. Wrong information on the Internet? When has that ever happened? This must be the first time. Yeah. <laughs> Funny, funny story about wrong information on the internet. Um, way back in the day, um, somebody emailed me. I think it might have been a family friend or something, and said, "Did you know you have a Wikipedia page?" And I said, "I don't know what Wikipedia is because this was back back then." And so I looked it up, and I was just like, "Hey, I got a Wikipedia page. I don't know what that means, but you know, somebody did it. It wasn't me. I didn't even know Wikipedia existed." And about a year later, I started getting like an occasional email. This is before social media. I kept getting an occasional email saying, so sorry about what you're going through, praying for you, you're going to make it. And I'm like, it's weird. But I got a lot of emails, so I didn't think too much of it. And then more emails started coming in. You're going to beat this. You know, don't you worry. Thinking healthy thoughts for you. And like, it just kept happening where people kept sending me these really kind emails, but it was all about like overcoming a struggle of some sort. And I finally got one from somebody I kind of knew um, uh, a friend of mine from Ohio. And I said, Jen, you got to explain this to me. Why am I getting all these emails saying, and she said, well, your Wikipedia page says you're suffering from pancreatic cancer. <laughs> I said, what? I'm the healthiest person I know. No, I said, that's wrong. So I was like, somebody teach me how to go in and edit Wikipedia so I can take And Sure enough, it said right there on my Wikipedia page, Ryan Drummond has been suffering from pancreatic cancer since so, so, such and such a year. And so, Yeah. Correct stuff all the time. That's kind of the downside also of, you know, being, um, I mean, famous is subjective. Let's say a public figure of some degree is, um, it, it, it's a balance because sometimes you can get away with stuff that like um, an, an average person would not be able to get away with. And then also you also get stuff said about you that's not true all the time. You know, rumors are just part of it. And that's, you know, and that's for anybody too. You know, online bullying happens at every level, <laughs> not just school, not just school age, but uh, it follows you. So if you have a recognizable name, you're going to have you're going to have crazy stuff said about you. And sometimes it's humorous and sometimes it's just downright mean. But um, I went on one of these uh, websites once because a friend of mine had said that they uh, it was one of those clickbait articles where it's like how much celebrities are worth. And somebody, uh, an old school friend of mine had found me on one of them said, you should go look that you're actually on this article. And it was, you know, how much celebrities are worth. And I'm all the way down at the bottom of the article. And it said, Ryan Drummond. And it didn't even have my picture. It had a picture of the Sonic the Hedgehog Thanksgiving Day float uh, balloon. <laughs> so it had a picture of a big Sonic balloon going down uh, in New York. And it said, uh, Ryan Drummond, the original voice of Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, net worth $85 million. <laughs> No, that's not even close. Pretty sure I have eighty-five dollars, but eighty-five million dollars? No. So, so yeah. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's it's hilarious, and sometimes it's annoying. When you say the the lines travel across the world before the truth gets to you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna steal that. Yeah, lies are like flash paper. Yeah, and uh, the truth is like a burning log. Yeah, totally. Do you have a question in the way way in the back? Yeah, um, so, uh, just for a second, I've heard things for, like, forever, and it's nice to have you here. Thank uh, you. I was just wondering, because I've always been curious about, like, game development and whatnot, how was voice direction for recording for games look like? How did that go? 
I was the voice direction for the games. Um, yeah. Um, it really, when it started out, um, the casting director uh, for the f first few Sonic games, her name is Lonnie Manella. And um, and she's still with us, still doing her voiceover thing. She just lost her cat yesterday, I saw on Twitter. So that's too bad. She had to put her cat down yesterday. Um, she called her her little furry worry, which I thought was really sweet. Um, but Lonnie is a very hands-on director. And she is also known for, and I think John St. John would back me up on this, like I'm gesturing to where he was yesterday. He's not there right now. Um, yeah, um, but he, uh, she would often let you read the line once and then she would give you what's called a line reading where she would do the line how she thought it should be and then she would want you to mimic back what she had done. So it'd be like, you know, pick up the gold ring and she'd be like, that'd be great, but do it like this. Pick up the gold ring and you'd be like, okay, pick up the gold ring. She'd be like, great, next line. So she was very hands-on like that to the point of like actually giving you line reading. And that's fine because when you're new to the franchise and she knows what Sega wants, and so she's going to kind of steer you in that direction, that's fine. And then as the games got, uh, we went on in time and I knew the character better. I knew, I feel like I could embody Sonic more. I knew how he would say a line, etc. cetera. Um, she kind of backed off more and I was able to just kind of like do the lines how I thought they should be read and and they were cool with that. So yeah, the... the uh, the direction kind of goes on a sliding scale over time. A lot at the beginning and then not very much at the end. And to the fact, you know, to the point where when I'm working on Sonic and Tails R, um, sometimes like Emmy and Dorian are listening in on what I'm doing. And they usually say, just give me three different line readings of each line. And they pick the one that they like the most. And occasionally you'll go back and give them three more. But they just kind of let you do what you think you should do. Yeah. What time are we at? Can I make sure? Okay, cool. We've got about 10 more minutes. Yeah. What part did I sing? Um, I have been a baritone my whole life. Um, I actually was a part of an acapella group for five years called the AYU Quartet. We're still out there. Apple Music, Spotify. Um, and I was actually the bass for that quartet, but only because the other three guys were all second tenors. <laughs> And when you have a quartet, you kind of have to split it up. So, uh, so I took the bass, and then one of the second tenors took baritone. One of the other second tenors got to sing second tenor, and then one of the other second tenors got to sing first tenor. Um, but uh, I, I've been a baritone since I was 14, and uh, so that's kind of what I've tried to stay in. Although being in musical theater for most of my life, um, and also just kind of the way I look, um, a lot of casting directors think, think I look like a tenor or that I, I look more like a tenor than a bass. So I get hired to do a lot of tenor roles. So I've sung a lot of tenor roles in musical theater. But when it comes to like say choral music or uh, instrumental or you know band music or so forth, I, uh, I try to stay in the baritone range. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, they, they had a, a little male group in my high school, and, uh, and I decided I wanted to be a tenor one as well. And so I got to sing in falsetto, like, for the entire semester. And that was fun. I loved it. Because it was just something different, you know. So that's fun. Mm, which kid to go with? Um, okay, Noah, and then I'll get you again. For Knuckles? Yes. Um, that, you have to look it up on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody has to pull that up. I really don't remember what I did for Knuckles because it was way before you were born. So, yeah. I, uh, I didn't do my research, but somebody will find it for me and pull it up. We'll all hear what it sounded like together. I assume it was actually closer to my normal voice, I think. Um, but, uh, I don't know, maybe a little lower and gruffer. I don't know. Man. I'm not sure. We'll find out. We'll get back to you on that one. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> it's before noon. Try to do the sonic voice before noon. Listen, 
People are always going to say negative things about you, but don't listen to them because you know in your heart what a nice person you are. I've known you for at least 24 hours, and I think you're great. So keep going fast, keep your head down, and keep your friends close and your enemies far, far away. Aw, oh, yeah! There you go. <laughs> Yeah. No one else has any other questions. I, I think it's you. So you did some also some voice work, not just for Knuckles, but also for Shadow. Yes. And during the final boss fight, when it's like super Shadow, it's kind of subtle in that I didn't know that it was you Good. until someone pointed it out, but now that I hear it, it's like, yeah, that's it. Right. So my question for you is what happened there. Is, is that when I took over for David Humphrey? Yeah, I think... David Humphrey does utter the last line Shadow ever does, which is after that fight. Right. But during that fight, when Shadow says, Sonic, what's going on? You're almost out of range. Switch with me. It's yeah, you. right. So it's like he's sick on the second to last day of recording. No, no, but that's a good. That's a. That's a. Th that could have happened, uh, but that's not what happened. Um, here we're gonna we're gonna um, throw a little dirt on Sega. Um, so of course the lines are not recorded linearly, so they're not sequential. So sometimes you'll do, you know, the you'll you'll come in and you'll do the final boss battle, and then you'll come in on the last day and do the intro. You know, it's always out of order. It just depends where they are in the scripts, what is done at that time. Um, also, sometimes in the later games they would show us animations, um, not finalized animations, but kind of scratch anime of what they or what the scenes looked like, so we could kind of see what we were doing. And so some days you'd come in and they'd have you know this scene and this scene and this scene, but not these two. They were not ready yet. So um, what happened with David is that they had asked him to come in, and the way the rules go um, with the Screen Actors Guild is that you are paid for an entire day. As soon as you step in the door, you get the whole day rate. And they can keep you as long as they need you up to eight hours, but they have to pay you the day rate. Even if you work five minutes, they have to pay you for the day. And so David had come in, and he had done all of his lines, and he had worked seven, eight hours or whatever, and I was scheduled in the studio after him. And so I happened to be there when he was finishing up. So he finished his time and he left. And since he had left the building, gotten his car and driven away, that means he had left the property. And so they realized that they had missed those two or three lines. And Sega was like, we don't want to pay to have David come back in for another day rate to record three lines. So in a money saving move, they asked if I could impersonate David since I happened to already be there in the studio working on my Sonic stuff. They were like, can you just, can you just cover these, these few lines? And I said, sure, I'll give it a shot. And so that's why I become Shadow for a few lines. It's just because somebody over at Sega was too cheap to hire David for another day. It really is. And you want to actually hear a little story about this. I've told this story before, so maybe one or two of you have heard it. But you, you learn as you go through the business that it really is a business. And if you ever want to find out why anything happens in this business, follow the money. Always follow the money. Um, like, as an example, there was a show on NBC called Trauma. And it, and it was like the biggest show on NBC. This is years ago. And I actually got to be on it for a day. I got to be at an outdoor um, festival where a car drove through this festival and ran into my best friend. And I got to go, ah. it's great. But um, super popular show. But the thing about trauma was is that the budget for it was so high. Like every episode, they were blowing up a tanker truck and they were shutting down highways and they were flying in helicopters. And it was a very exciting show. But the budget was just too much. And so even though it was like in the top five shows of NBC at the time, it was canceled. And everyone was like, how could you cancel one of the most popular shows? It was never going to be able to make money. So if it doesn't make money, it's not any good to them. So NBC was like, ax it, gone. And that sort of thing happens all the time. The way it happened to me was, is that when I was recording the original Sonic Adventure game, um, my contact at Sega, his name is Keith, and uh, he had come into the studio and he was just like, hey, just want to let you know, you know, that we have some plans, you know, for the franchise. And one of the things they're talking about is doing a cartoon. Sega was going to actually do their own cartoon for, uh, for Sonic. And this is before Sonic X. And, uh, and I was just like, that, oh, great. 
because of course every voiceover actor like the holy grail is to have your own cartoon right to and to be the lead in the cartoon that is the goal like everybody would would want that and so i was super excited that they were going to do a cartoon and i was going to be able to have my my cartoon and um and so i'm waiting for the game to come out and wait for the game to come out and it does and it's a huge huge hit it sells 42 million dollars in the first day huge hit and so i was just like yes can't wait. Can't wait for that call about that cartoon. And a week passes and I don't get a call. And then a two weeks passes and I don't get a call. And finally, I called up Keith at Sega and I said, so the game's a hit. Let's do this cartoon. And he said, we're not doing a cartoon. As if I was crazy. And I said, what do you mean we're not doing a cartoon? The game is a huge hit. And he said to me, and I'll never forget it. He said, okay, Ryan, did you ever watch cartoons on Saturday morning? And I said, of course I did. And he said, what are cartoons for? To, to entertain kids? Nope. Try again. What are cartoons for? And I was dumbfounded. I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, you, you got to fill me in. He said, cartoons are there to sell products. Cartoons are commercials to sell the products. You never see a cartoon that doesn't have a toy attached to it or a Happy Meal thing or a or a or a because the cartoon is there to sell the toy or the video game or the whatever. So he said, we're not going to do a cartoon because the game is selling fine. We don't need a cartoon. And all of a sudden I was just like. And I realized, oh, the world is not how I thought it was. I thought they made cartoons to entertain kids. It's not how it works. Cartoons are to sell things. So, and I hate to like put a rain cloud over that, but, <laughs> but that's how it was. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. I have to get back to my table, but thank you so much. It's been fun talking to you guys. And I'll be there at my table till five o'clock. So let's go wander around, have some snacks, and let's have some fun.